Hello, friends. I'm so glad that you tuned into this message from Pastor Skip. It's the first part in a brand new series that we're calling Adulting. And Pastor Skip is going to carry us through the book of James. Today, we're going to be talking about two words, grow up or growing up. And our heart for you is that as you hear God's word, that it would help you to mature and grow up into who he wants you to be. would love for you to get connected with our watch parties. You can always go to calvarynm.church slash locations and find people to watch service with. We would also be interested in hearing where you're from because we'd like to consider starting a campus wherever you are. With that, grab your Bibles. Here's Pastor Skip. My oldest brother was named James, Jim, and uh, one of his frequent admonitions to me as the youngest of four boys was, grow up. He would love to say that to his younger brothers, especially me, grow up. Well, essentially, that is what the book of James says to us that as believers, we should reach maturity, we should grow up. You know, having a baby is exciting. Uh, if, how, many, how many parents do we have that have had babies before? <laughs> sort of a trick question. How many of you once were babies? Raise your hand. Okay, okay some of you just are not engaged at all. Um, sort of like the class that we just saw on the video. But when you have a baby and you hear that baby's first sounds, first words, you record it, you take pictures of it, you share it with family and friends because it's so exciting. Fast forward 25 years. If a 25-year-old is saying mama, dada, and holding a bottle, not so excited. Because you figure by that time there should be maturity. That child should grow up. Somebody once said a baby is a digestive apparatus with a loud noise at one end and no responsibility at the other end. <laughs> so you want that to change. It's appreciated for what it is, but not for the long haul. So how do you know when you're an adult? Well, a few people took a stab at it and said this, you know you're an adult when the bills in the mailbox start coming in your name. You know you're an adult when 4.30 a.m. is early in the morning instead of late at night. You know you're an adult when the heater kicks on and the first thought you have is how much it's going to cost. You know you're an adult when you start hearing your favorite song in an elevator. You know that you're an adult when jeans and a sweater no longer qualify as dressed up. You know you're an adult when your car insurance goes down and your car payment goes up. You know you're an adult when dinner and a movie is the whole date, not the beginning of one. You know you're an adult when you actually eat breakfast food at breakfast time. You know you're an adult when 93% of the photos on your phone are of your pet or baby, and the rest of the pictures are things you're trying to sell on Craigslist to make room for your pet or baby. <laughs> and finally, you know you're an adult when the thought of buying a new sofa or kitchen appliance makes you as giddy as a 12-year-old at a Justin Bieber concert. <laughs> Welcome to adulthood. Now, just as having a baby is exciting, a spiritual baby, a born-again individual is even more exciting. When you see someone make a decision to follow Jesus Christ and experience the thrill of salvation, the joy of forgiveness, the feeling of peace and joy that comes over them, having a brand new start is infinitely more exciting but there's more. You see, there's two great themes that run through the Bible from cover to cover. The first theme is how to get to God. The second theme is how to walk with God. The first theme is directed to lost humanity. The second theme is devoted to saved humanity. 
Once you know God personally, you grow in Him continually. Both of those themes run through the Scripture. So Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. But that's just the beginning. After the new birth comes growth. Growth is expected. And so James is the adult in the room, the older brother, if you will, saying to younger brothers and sisters, it's time for you to grow up in all things in Christ Jesus. Now, today, as we begin the book of James, uh, I'm going to look with you at one verse, just James chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, that probably doesn't take some of you by surprise, uh, but I have managed to break uh, James 1 into four separate pieces. Um, by the way, there are 108 verses in the book of James. If we were to take just one verse a week, it would take us over two years. So I will speed up as we go. But today we want to look at verse 1 because I want to give you the introductory material so you understand who this guy was, why he wrote it, and just the basis of what we're getting into. So we're going to look at four things, the author, the autobiography, the audience, and the address. Let's begin with the author. The first word in the book is the word of the author, James. So we know who wrote the book. James wrote the book of James. That's typically how people in the New Testament wrote letters. They didn't write their name at the end of a letter like we do. We uh, say, dear so-and-so, and put our name at the end so that the first thing we do when we get a letter is look at the very last page to find out who wrote it. So they saved you the time in antiquity and put the guy's name or gal's name at the beginning. So James begins with his name. The problem is, though it says James, we have to ask the question, which one? Because there weren't just one or two, there were no less than four different men named James in the New Testament. So let me give you the first three that we can push aside and end with the author of this book. The first James in the New Testament, the most famous James, was the brother of John. James and John, both disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, both sons of Zebedee, fishermen up in the Galilee region. Sons of Zebedee, nicknamed Sons of Thunder by Jesus. Remember that? Because they wanted to nuke a Samaritan village that didn't receive Christ as readily as they thought they should. So James and John, Sons of Zebedee, that James did not write this book because he died too early. He was martyred in Acts chapter 12 by Herod, who put him to death with the sword. So we can push him aside. The second James in the New Testament is James, the son of Alphaeus, also a disciple of Jesus Christ. But besides that, we don't know anything about him. We just know he was one of the 12. And because we don't know anything about him, he is often called James the Less, James the less, not because he's a less significant person in the eyes of our Lord, but simply because we know less about him than we know about the first James. He was never seriously considered by any scholar to be the author of this book. Second or third is James, the father of Judas, not Iscariot. Let me explain that. James, the father of Judas, not Iscariot. You may not know this, but Jesus did not have one follower named Judas. He had two named Judas among the 12. We know less about this guy than we do even about the second guy. And uh, James, the father of Judas, is only mentioned because he is the father of a disciple. So we have three men named James. We're pushing them aside, and we're ending on this fourth person named James, and this is James, the blood brother of Jesus, actually related to Jesus by blood, the oldest half-brother, the natural son of Mary and Joseph. Now, we know that Mary was a virgin when Jesus was born, 
Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the virgin womb of Mary. But after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Mary and Joseph, being married, had several children together. We read that in a few places in the New Testament. One is when Jesus went to Nazareth. Remember when he went into the synagogue and he stood up and he opened the scroll of Isaiah and he quoted from it, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to open the prison doors to those who are bound, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He closed the scroll, handed it back to the moderator and said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And they didn't like that. They got all upset, saying, who does he think he is? And they said, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And aren't these his sisters? So Joseph and Mary had a large family after Jesus was virgin born. James is the one who occupies number one on that list. So he is the oldest second um, or oldest half brother of Jesus. So James grew up in the same home as Jesus. Now just imagine having an older brother who was perfect. Imagine having an older brother who never sinned. That would be intimidating, wouldn't it? How come Jesus never gets spanked, mom and dad? But James grew up in that home. Now, James was not a believer in Jesus during Jesus' whole earthly ministry. He did not believe he was the Messiah. He did not believe he was the Lord of all. John chapter 7, verse 5 says, Even his own brothers did not believe in him. So James grew up in the home, but when Jesus launched his ministry, James said, I don't believe it. I'm not going to be a follower. In Mark chapter 3, when our Lord had crowds of people coming to him in Capernaum, and he wasn't even taking a break to eat, it says, when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Man, our brother is crazy, telling everybody he's the long-awaited Messiah. So they definitely didn't believe in him. And James held that opinion through all the years of Jesus' ministry until something changed his mind. Anybody know what that might be? The resurrection. And Paul describes that in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. He was buried, raised on the third day according to the Scripture. And he appeared to Peter, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brethren at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. So James got his own post-resurrection appearance interview with the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was that post-resurrection event that changed James' mind. He became a believer. We know that because in the opening chapters of the book of Acts, James, the brother of Jesus, is with his mother Mary in the upper room with the 120 followers of Jesus when that church started. And evidently, James became very prominent very quickly. He became the head of the church at Jerusalem. He was the one that superintended and directed the council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. When we get to Galatians chapter 1, Paul refers to James as the brother of our Lord and also as a pillar in the church at Jerusalem. So, James was a late bloomer, but he flowered well. He grew very quickly in his faith. He became very deeply spiritual, so much so that though he was not one of the original apostles, he is seen as the head of the church in Jerusalem. 
Now, as time went on, he became known as James the Just. That's how early church historians write about him. James the Just, because he was deeply spiritual. Eusebius, a early church historian, writes this. James used to enter alone into the temple and be found kneeling and praying for forgiveness for the people so that his knees grew hard like a camel's because of its constant worship of God. And he became known as that old camel knees. He'd always be praying, deeply spiritual. So that James wrote this book. And one of the reasons we believe that is not just because the other three don't qualify, but also because the language in the text of the book of James is very similar to the language in the text of the letter in Acts chapter 15 written by James to the Gentile churches in Antioch. The language is similar, similar, and James wrote that one, and so we believe that James wrote, that James wrote this book of James couple of other quick facts about him. Tradition says that he died around A.D. 62, and he was pushed off the temple, landed on the hard ground, still alive, was beaten to death by the Pharisees until he died. Uh, One other fact that you may find interesting. In 2002, an ossuary was found in Jerusalem. An ossuary is a little box made out of stone, Ossuary is where they put bones of people. So they would bury, the Jews would bury people in a sepulcher. The flesh would corrode over time. All that would be left are the bones. They would take the bones, put it in a box, a bone box called an ossuary. In 2002, they found an ossuary in Jerusalem that says, James, the son of Joseph, the brother of Jesus. So that's a recent archaeological discovery. Some are disputing it. Some are holding to it, being authentic. But I thought you should know. So that's the author, James. He is the half-brother of Jesus. But notice what he calls himself. This is now the autobiography. James, a bond servant of God and, meaning and a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'll be honest with you. I think if Jesus were my brother, I probably would have mentioned that in the beginning of my letter. But there's no trace of it here. Um, He could have easily said, James the just, or James from the sacred womb of Mary, the congenital sibling to Jesus Christ, the Lord of the universe. I mean, talk about name dropping, that would be the name to drop if you are related to Jesus. He doesn't do that. He just says, James, a bond servant of God and of Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's significant because few people knew Jesus as intimately as James knew him ate at the same table, played at the same places, raised in the same synagogue, probably shared each other's clothes. I did. I got all hand-me-downs. I was number four, and I got all their clothes because I washed them. They're good. I'm not going to buy you new ones. But James the just is James the humble, and probably he is still regretting the fact that he was an unbeliever for so long a time. And so he begins his letter very humbly as a bond servant. Let me tell you a little bit about that word and what this indicates that James knew. James knew his rightful place. James knew his rightful place. He uses a very particular word here for servant. It's the word doulos. Doulos was the word for a common slave in the Roman Empire. William Barclay says there were probably about 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire at that time, about 120 plus million people altogether. So about half of the population in the Roman Empire were slaves. Slave labor ran the empire. And the common term for a common slave was a doulos, one in permanent servitude 
to another. He calls himself that, a slave, a slave of Jesus, a bond slave of Jesus. In calling uh, Jesus the Lord Jesus, and in my English Bible it's capitalized, he is recognizing the lordship of his half-brother as the Lord of all. I'll tell you why I think this is significant. Because today, there is a trend to um, have celebrity pastors and uh, superstar pastors. And, you know, this guy's something special and something awesome. And we even love all the titles. Call me Doctor, Reverend, Bishop. How about Slave? All the New Testament authors began their letters with this word. Paul, a bondservant. Peter, a bondservant. Jude, a bondservant. Incidentally, Jude was the other half-brother of Jesus who wrote a New Testament book. Paul, a bondservant, and James as well. Another James, Jim Irwin, who was an astronaut, eighth person to walk on the moon, said this. As I was returning to the earth... I realized that I was a servant and not a celebrity. So I am here as God's servant on planet Earth to share what I have experienced that others might know the glory of God. One of our astronauts, Jim Irwin, said, I'm not a celebrity, I'm a servant to show you the glory of God. That's how James felt about his life. He knew his rightful place. He's the master, I'm the servant. Also, in using this term, he knew his notable peers. James was Jewish, grew up in a Jewish home, knew his Old Testament, and he must have known that some of the greatest heroes of the Old Testament were referred to as servants of God. Moses was called a servant of the Lord, Joshua, Caleb, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Job, and Isaiah were all known as servants, slaves of God. So the first question in adulting 101 is this, are you willing to serve him? Are you willing to serve him? Are you willing to be his tool, his instrument? Paul will write in Romans chapter 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. It makes sense. It's the right thing to do. It's your spiritual act of worship. Let God have your body and work through your body. Let your body be his instrument to touch people on the earth. That's adulting, is when you are willing to be a servant for him. You might have tremendous Talents, tremendous gifts. Awesome. How are you using them for his glory? There was a visitor to a mission hospital overseas, and it was the first time that this person went to a mission hospital, and this person noticed a nurse in the mission hospital tending to a a person with leprosy. And as this person got closer and saw the nurse dabbing the oozing wounds of the leper, she sort of recoiled and said, I'd never do that for a million dollars. The nurse said, neither would I, but I'd do it for Jesus for nothing. I'd do it for Jesus for nothing. You know you're an adult when you are willing to use your life to serve him. So we have the author, James, the autobiography, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at the audience. Who is this book written to? We're told, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Now, the word 12 tribes, or the words 12 tribes, is a a common title for what people group? The Jews. The 12 tribes of Israel. Um, All the tribes that we read about in the Old Testament. The 12 tribes... Of Israel, so it's a Jewish audience, but notice, which are scattered abroad. 
That's a very important term, and some of you are aware of this term, the diaspora, or the diaspora. The diaspora is still a word, though it's a Greek word, it's a word we have in our English language, that speaks of Jews living outside of Israel, Jews living outside the Holy Land of Israel. The dispersion, or the diaspora, began way back in the Old Testament in 722 B.C. when the Assyrians took captive the ten northern tribes of Israel. That began the dispersion of the Jews around the world. They expelled them from their land. They took them to Assyria. 150 years later, 586 B.C., the Babylonians took the two remaining tribes to Babylon, took over Assyria so that all 12 tribes ended up under Babylonian rule. That's where the dispersion began. So what happened is you now have Jews not only in Israel, but you have them in every major metropolitan area in the known Mediterranean world, from Alexandria, Egypt, to Rome, all abroad. And they did something in those places because they're not in their homeland. They don't have a temple to worship at. They built a new institution called the synagogue. The synagogue, where Jews could meet in a local community. That's where the synagogue developed during the diaspora. Now, why am I telling you this? Because it is the dispersion of the Jews and the establishment of the synagogue that became the greatest impetus for the spread of the gospel in the New Testament. Because when Paul went to all the different towns in the Mediterranean world, what's the first place he visited? Synagogue. And that was important because the gospel was to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to the Gentile. If he would have begun in the marketplace of the Gentiles, the Jews never would receive the message because they would have said, this is a Gentile religion. So it was the synagogue that became the place where the gospel was preached throughout the world by Paul. But there was another scattering, and it is this scattering that I believe James is referring to when he says, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. And this scattering that I'm referring to is the scattering of Jewish Christians from Jerusalem. You know, the early church started in Jerusalem, and most all of them were Jewish. But there was tremendous persecution that happened to them because of their belief in Jesus as the Messiah. So for the first several chapters of the book of Acts, we see the church growing, growing, growing. 120, then 3,120, then another 5,000 men, then multitudes of men and women. So you have this massive group of Jewish believers in Jerusalem until Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, after the stoning of Stephen and Saul of Tarsus folding his arms and receiving the clothes of those who stoned him, it says in Acts chapter 8 verse 1, at that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, do you, do you remember that Jesus in, in Acts 1 said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth? Remember when he said that? You know what they did about that? What's, what's that the universal sign for? Zero. They did nothing about that. They stayed in Jerusalem. They didn't go to Judea. They didn't go to Samaria. Why would they? I mean, this is where the, I'm under the spout where the glory comes out. I'm, this is exciting. There's thousands of people here believing in Jesus. This is an awesome place to be. But Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So what does he do? He allows persecution to scatter them. He allows the persecution to get them into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth because they're not budging. So they were scattered. Same chapter, verse 4 says, Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. I just want you to 
to get this, that God permitted the scattering of his children to reach the unreached world. That was part of his plan, to reach the unreached world. By the way, the word diaspora in Greek often is used for scattering seed. A farmer would scatter seed in the field to get it planted so he would have more fruit. So let's apply that. Maybe you've been laid off recently, and you go, why, God, would you allow this to happen? Maybe he wants you somewhere else. He wants to scatter you somewhere else. Maybe you are getting transferred by your company to another city. You don't want to go to that city. All your friends are here. Your family's here. Why, Lord, would you let that happen? Maybe he is scattering you to plant you there to cause more fruit to come. So that's the audience to the 12 tribes which are scattered, dispersed, diaspora abroad. So we have the author, the autobiography, and the audience. Let's look at the last little section, the address. You'll notice that James begins with a simple one-word salutation, simple address, very short salutation. He says, greetings. Now, Paul's were much longer. Peter's were much longer. Not James. He likes the economy of words, just greetings, and then he jumps right into his letter. Now, I believe that that translation is a little bit stilted. I don't think you get the full impact of the original language. Um, The word that he uses translated here as greetings is the word kairos or kairain, which means rejoice, be glad. To the 12 tribes scattered abroad, be glad, rejoice. And I think that's important because if you have read the book of James and you're thinking, yeah, this guy was a little bit kind of buttoned up and kind of a curmudgeon kind of a guy, you know, faith without works is dead, you know, one of those kind of guys, maybe a little legalistic. You don't know James. James was so full of joy and so full of life, he begins by saying, be glad, rejoice. And the very next verse, he says, rejoice in times of trial. Count it all joy, brethren. Verse 2, when you fall into various trials. So we'll talk about that next time, but uh, he begins with this beautiful greeting. Now, you're going to notice something about James. If you have read it, you know this already. He's very practical. It is often called the Proverbs of the New Testament because it's very practical in application. That's not to say Paul's letters are not practical. They are, but... If you know about Paul's letters, he, he front loads all of his letters with all sorts of imposing doctrine. And after that, then he gets to the practical part. So the book of Romans, for example, 11 chapters of doctrine. Chapter 12 begins the application, the practical part. Therefore, brethren, present your bodies, etc. He does that also in Ephesians, three chapters of doctrine at the beginning, and then the practical section, not James. James jumps right in after the greeting with practical admonition and instruction and continues that all the way to the very end. Now, what is this book of James about? What is its theme? Well, these Jewish believers that he is writing to are having some problems, James addresses these problems. They're going through trials, very difficult, persecution trials. They're being tempted, facing temptations. Some of them are catering to the rich. Some of them are competing for offices in the church, causing divisions in the church. And many of them have problems with their mouth. They have tongue trouble. A chapter is devoted to that. In other words... The same problems we face today are the same problems that James wrote about then. What is the cause of all these problems? Spiritual immaturity. Spiritual immaturity. So the basic theme of this little book of James is spiritual maturity. Don't stay immature. Grow up, like my older brother James would say. Grow up. That's the basic theme. He uses a word throughout this book several times. It's the word perfect, which means mature, complete. 
Um, don't think of James telling you to be sinlessly perfect. Good luck with that one. Uh, even though I've met a few people who claim they were sinlessly perfect, until I got to have a conversation with them and discovered they're lying to me. <laughs> but he uses the word perfect, and I just want to show that to you, just a few places. Look at verse 4. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That means mature. Go down to chapter 2. Verse 22, do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect, complete, mature? Chapter 3, verse 2, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. So he is moving his audience toward maturity, growing up. Warren Wiersbe said, spiritual maturity is one of the greatest needs in churches today. Too many churches are playpens for babies instead of workshops for adults. So James will put our faith to the test in this book so that we might grow spiritually. Now, I want to close with this. A few things you should know about spiritual growth. Let me give them to you. Number one, it's normal. To grow in your faith is normal. You know, we sometimes look at a person and go, man, that's amazing, he's growing. Why is that amazing? That's like looking at a baby saying, isn't it amazing? He's not a baby anymore. He's actually growing. <laughs> well, that's what you expect when there's birth. You expect life. You expect growth. And it's not just for a few. It's for all. Christianity is more than obstetrics. It's more than the new birth. It's pediatrics. It's a visit to the emergency room sometimes. A counseling session. It could even be surgery. It is all the way to geriatrics. In 1 John chapter 1, John addresses his letter to three groups, children, young men, and fathers. And he meant that spiritually. That's normal, to have children who grow into young men who grow into fathers. There's maturity that takes place. So, First thing about spiritual growth, it's normal. Second, it's supernatural. It requires spiritual cooperation with God. The New Testament term for that is sanctification. Just as God saved you, God grows you up. It, it is a supernatural work. Now, I'll tell you why I think that is so important, because spiritual growth has nothing to do with physical age. Well, of course I'm mature. Look how old I am. Well, you can grow old, but not grow up. Charles Spurgeon said, in the church of God, there are children who are 70 years old. Yes, little children displaying all the infirmities of declining years. One would not like to say of a man of 80 that he had scarcely cut his wisdom teeth, and yet there are such. On the other hand, there are fathers in the church of God, wise, stable, instructed, who are comparatively young men. The Lord can cause His people to grow rapidly and far outstrip their years. So it's normal. It's supernatural. Third thing about spiritual growth, it's gradual. Now, I hope, I hope you take heart in that. It's not like, okay, well, I'll come forward and you pray for me and now I'm going to be mature. It doesn't happen that way. Christian maturity is not a light switch. It's a process. It takes time. It takes a lifetime. And when you make it to the end of your life and you die, you still won't be perfect until you get there, and then you will be. So it's normal, it's supernatural, it's gradual. Fourth, and we'll close with this, it's possible. It's possible. What I mean by that is you can grow, listen, as much as you want to grow. 
You can grow spiritually as much as you want to grow. The question is, do you want to grow? Do you really want it? Are you willing to do what it takes to get there? When Peter wrote his letter, he said, God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us. Therefore, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge self-control. Add to your faith. Grow. He also wrote, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And he closed out his second letter by saying, grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it's normal, it's supernatural, it's gradual, it's possible. If you want to, you can grow. Now I'm going to give you a spoiler alert here of where we're going in the book of James. There's two factors in maturity, two vitamins that you take that boost your maturity level. Want to know what they are? Trials and temptations. Yeah, you know, sometimes you take medicine, you go, ooh, I hate that medicine. Well, yeah, trials and temptations. Yeah, not so much. But those are two factors in maturity, trials and temptations. Trials are sent by God to mature us. Temptations are sent by the devil to destroy us. But God uses them to mature us. You get that? One comes from God, one comes from the devil, but God uses that to mature us because all things work together for good to those who love God. That's why it's, it's really fruitless to say, you know, I, I'm having all sorts of problems. Is this from the devil or from God? Who cares? <laughs> Deal with it. Grow from it. Learn from it. Don't worry about the source. Worry about the result. Over in the Alps, I think in Switzerland, there's a monument to a guide who died ascending a peak to rescue a stranded tourist. And on the tombstone is a simple inscription that says, he died climbing. That's how I want to die. Growing, climbing. Not like, yeah, I'm good enough. I'll just come to church every now and then. Um, no, no, no. I want to die climbing, don't you? Don't you want to grow, 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 mature? Uh, one of the first steps, if you haven't done this already, is to get a Bible, a real Bible, one that you know where things are and you can follow along and not just listen to stuff, but really dig in yourself and read it. So this is spiritual adulting. And just like my older brother, Jim, would say to me, Skip, grow up, our older brother, James, would say, y'all, it's time to grow up in all things in Christ Jesus. Father, thank you for this call that we are going to receive in this book. The call to grow, the call to maturity, the call to bear fruit, uh, even in difficult situations, in trials, in temptations, in times of relational tension. Lord, you love us the way we are, we often say, but you love us too much to leave us the way we are. You want us to grow. You're committed to that. Um, you are committed more to that than we are committed to that. But I pray, Lord, that we would be. I pray that we would want spiritual growth. I pray that we would want to learn the lessons. I pray that we would want to serve you, to be used by you, to know that our lives, like Jim Irwin, were spent showing people the glory of God. Father, I pray for anybody who might be with us today who they can't grow because they haven't been born yet. They haven't been, had the new birth. Oh, they may believe in God or have a religious experience in the past, but there's never been a conscious, authentic surrender yet. Or they just said, God, I want you to take control of my life. I'm giving my heart to you, my life to you. 
they, they will find at that moment that new life will happen and joy will happen and peace will happen and forgiveness will happen. But it is a decision that you, by your sovereign power and grace, allow us to have. And so, Father, we pray that some today would choose to be chosen by God. Choose to say yes to life. If that describes some of you, if you've never given your life to Christ, or if you did at one time and you've backslidden, you've walked away, you're not following Him today, you want to return home, Our heads are bowed. I'm going to leave my eyes open so I can see. But if you're willing today to trust in Jesus, to make it real, to make it personal, I want you to raise your hand up. Just raise it up so I can notice it. And once I do, you can put it back down. God bless you in the back. Thank you for that. Another one in the back. Right over here to my right. Anyone else? Just raise your hand up. If you're outside, there are pastors out there. Just raise your hand up. They'll call you out. Bless you. Some of you know, deep in your heart, you've needed to do this for a long time. You've sensed it. You've known it. You just haven't done it yet. This is your opportunity. Anyone else, just raise it up. Father, we thank you for these who have raised their hand up, young and old. And we pray, Father, that as they give their lives to you, as they put feet on their faith, so to speak, as they receive Christ as their Savior, Lord, douse them with your joy. Let them know a sense of peace they've never known before, a sense of release they've never experienced yet. Change them as we welcome them into the family. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. As we stand and sing this song, if you raised your hand, I'm going to ask you to do something you didn't plan on doing when you came in this morning, and that is to get up from where you are standing now, find the nearest aisle, and walk all the way up to the front where I'm going to stand with you. When you all gather here, I'm going to lead you in a prayer to receive Christ as your Savior. For those of you who have come forward, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer out loud after me. You're talking to God now. You're just giving him your life. Prayer is a simple thing. Just like you talk to somebody else, you're, you're saying, God, take over my life. Save me. Mean this from your heart. And if you mean it, God will touch your heart, change you, save you. Say this, Lord, I give you my life. I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I believe in Jesus, that he died for me, that he shed his blood, but that he rose again. I turn from my sin. I repent. I turn to Jesus as Savior and Lord. It's in his name I pray. Amen.
What a great word that was for us today. I hope that you were encouraged by that. We would always love to hear stories of how God is using his word to change your life. So email us at mystory at calvaryabq.org. And as always, if you'd like to partner with us, you can click give in the top right corner of our website, and that will help us get on more platforms to take God's word all around the world.